In this podcast, Jules Pieri from The Gromit talks about the maker world and her interesting book, How We Make Stuff Now. So stay tuned. So welcome everyone to Work 2.0 podcast. Today we have with us a special treat. We have an amazing guest, uh, Jules Peary. Uh, she is a co-founder and CEO of The Gromit, um, a site that has launched more than 3,000 innovative consumer products since 2008. The company's citizen commerce movement is reshaping how products are discovered, shared, and bought. Jules started her career as industrial designer for technology companies and was an executive at Geds, Strideright, and PlaySchool. The Gromit is her third startup uh, following roles as VP of Continuum and president of Ziggs. In 2017, Ace Hardware acquired a major stake uh, in the Gromit. She was named one of the Fortune's most powerful women entrepreneurs in, in 2013 and one of the Goldman Sachs' uh, 100 most in, uh, interesting entrepreneurs in 2014. She is an entrepreneur in resident emeritus at Harvard Business School and an investing partner at X Factor Ventures. Um, so with that, Jules, welcome to the podcast. Thank you, Vishal. Glad to be here. Beautiful. I think what, um, uh, and I, we were chatting that before our conversation, what I found fascinating about your background is very few times you end up with um, folks, uh, you end up meeting folks who have actually created a, a company out, basically defining the future of uh, where the industry is heading to. And I think the Gromit has the same story. Anyone who's in Boston, they have heard about your company, I'm sure. Um, but to few who are not sure, like, can you walk us through, uh, number one, your journey? Like, what t- help us understand um, what brought you to this point? Sure. Um, honestly, I, I probably want to reel back to the late 90s when I was working at Play School and essentially saw the opportunity for this business. I was noticing that our best new product ideas didn't make it to market. They would just fall off the table. And that made no sense to me. And I asked my boss, what's going on here? We have great R&D capability. And she said, well, Jules, the, the small to medium retailers, the, the toy stores that used to um, that carry our, our new products are, are suffering. And there are less and less of them. So today, um, we've lost our farm leagues. If Kmart, Target, Toys R Us, or Walmart don't want it, we can't make it. And that really pissed me off, honestly. I didn't plan to Hmm. do anything about it at the moment. It seems somewhat unavoidable or inevitable. Fast forward to um, my last company where I was president of a social network. So I learned a lot. I was a pioneer in that media. I learned how to build a community and so the vision was, wait a minute, remember those four toy buyers who got in everyone's way? Let's just skip around them, create a community, launch products with a story, uh, almost like a little movie trailer, a video. And that's what we started doing October 20th, 2008. Interesting. And um, and tell us um, some of the challenges you faced uh, while, while bringing up the grommet, like what very early, early days. Like, what was what was it, it like? Um, well, I think there are a couple of things that come to mind quickly. One is, although I'd been a president of a company, I had never been a founder and a CEO. And at first, you really feel like an imposter. Like, and I'm I'm pretty confident, so that's not like my normal state of mind. Um, but I remember going to the first conference after I just incorporated the company and I put the name of the company on my name tag and nobody laughed. <laughs> it was such a tiny thing. But, oh, what do you do? What, what's your company? And like very quickly, you're occupying hmm. that role. And that was um, just the beginning of occupying the role in increments every single day. And, and some of the things that you have to do to get there aren't fun. Like I had to let our first, our third co-founder go the day we launched. Okay, 
my CEO cred goes up, you know, or my confidence. The first time, I mean, I'm only telling you terrible things because I think they're the ones that form you. Um, the first time mm -hmm. you have a lawsuit, okay, like, you know, complete sleepless nights, oh my God, and don't know what to do. But then you get through it and, you know, if another one comes your way, you're like, okay, I can take it, bring it on. Mm -hmm. So. It takes a while before the world gives you the job right away, and it takes mm. a while before you give it to yourself. Interesting, interesting. And um, I think one thing that I, I I I found fascinating, which I wanted to learn from you from from the early time I heard about the grommet. So when you talk about um, any sort of startup journey, right? They are all going through their different routes. They have their different creative um, side to how they want to, or how they envision themselves going out in public and sharing and all that. They all have that secret sauce, right? And I think when I looked at your grommet, it was very templatized in a way that it, it, it does take a lot of headaches away from these founders saying, okay, this is a good, as you said, it's a good creative trailer. Like, what are some of, what was some of your experience in getting getting that recipe right uh, that that helped uh, founders communicate their message and and giving out to the to the world that what they are making? It's it's really interesting. You notice that I don't think all people pick up on that. That that's kind of the core thing we do. In that, if you accept my contention that there's a an explosion of brilliant products coming out from small companies right now. We can talk about that later, why. Mm. But I could see that forming. And I could see the counter trend, the very negative counter trend in retail getting bigger. And mm. big retailers don't like to take risks. They, they can't. They can't mm. risk having empty shelves or products that don't sell. The scale's too big. So it seemed to me that that was happening. In the meantime, I could see when we were forming the business that consumers were being bombarded. Uh, marketplaces were starting to form like Amazon mm. and they could use a source of truth and trust for products quality because traditionally retailers did provide that, but we were losing that lens on retail. It was becoming kind of compete on price and not much else. So, and marketplaces don't make any attempt to vet for quality. It's not their job, really. So I said, what, how could I most help this explosion of companies? And it was essentially creating a place that had that lens on quality and innovation and the kind of values that people might want to support. And I think the thing you picked up on, Vishal, is you can't do that for yourself when you're a small producer. You can't say, look at me, I'm great. That alone doesn't work, but mm. even if you had the money, and most of them do not have the, the, the resources to create any dent whatsoever in a crowded world, and it's a sophisticated, hard thing to do. It took us a very long time to amass 3 million people in our community who follow what we launch every day. There's no economic reasoning behind most small companies wanting to do that. That doesn't mm. even make sense mm. for them to do that, even if they could. Um, but then you take it to like a meta level of, all right, not only are these people all hanging out together on this platform, the Gromit, but the communities hanging out there wants to know about these products. And they're the most desirable population to get to. They're curious and um, they'll take some chances and and um, they don't want to be on Kickstarter necessarily 100% because they, they, mm. they're too busy to, you know, get involved in projects. But yes, a product that's been vetted by the grommet, it's going to probably mm. be worth, they know, probably worth their time and money. And that's like gold to these makers to have somebody lend their credibility to them. That's pretty interesting. And um, let me take a back step. Uh, actually, I'm... Um, what is the grommet like to our listeners and viewers who have not um heard about your company or not seen you good point how would you how would you define um what the company is well we launch innovative products from small businesses they're manufactured they range from tools to toys to pet products and 
products that we launched a long time ago that your listeners probably would know would be Fitbit or SodaStream or OtterBox or um, Bananagrams or Idea Paint. I'm going to do an interview tomorrow with the founder of Simply Safe, which is a company that went public mm-hmm. and then private, but it was we were one of their first partners. It's a portable alarm system and our first Internet of Things launch that, that preceded Fitbit even. So what we launched today could be one of those products tomorrow. Interesting. And um, what is the right time when a company should, like, they approach you? Like, wh- when is the right time in their inception stage when someone says, okay, I should, I need a, I need a help from something like the, the Gromit? It's fairly predictable that they love to meet us right after a Kickstarter Indiegogo campaign because at that stage, they had been put through some paces. They had a really exciting time building the campaign if it was successful. They got a loan, essentially, against their first production. Mm. So they've learned how to fulfill some customer demand. That all ends in its crickets, and it's terrifying mm. because that machine that Kickstarter has created isn't something, again, that this company would have naturally on its own. And the press moves away and everyone moves away. So we pick up then. Typically, it's not 100% the case that everyone's crowdfunded, but it's a very good time to start with us. Okay, you did a project. Now let's build a business. We'll resume after a short break. This part of the podcast is brought to you by First Friday Fair, fastest AI-powered way to find your next opportunity. Check out the website firstfridayfair.tao.ai and find your next dream job. Let's get back to the podcast. Interesting. And, and and typically, um, you talked about Fitbit, you talked about SodaStream, you talked about Simply Safe. Like Simply Safe, they, they're all very different products in a totally yes. different, in only on, totally different space, totally different customer expectations, totally different market size and and segmentations. How do you provide them uh, a common platform? Like how do you when when you design and work on such a, such a discrete uh, problems? Uh, and very isolated problems in many in many cases. How do you end up uh, compiling them a good product or or a good experience that that sort of gel all these successful companies together somehow? I think it's two things. Uh, we take care and pride in doing a good job with their story, and that story is what centralizes everything. What call what knits it all together. I mean, it's a little bit like when you read the New York Times, you're bouncing from one story to another too. And that's not disconcerting, mm-hmm. right? Same thing here. We feel our, that our first job is to be interesting and worth your time. Second thing um, would be that from the maker standpoint, they really want access to customers. That's job one, two, and three as far as mm-hmm. they're concerned. We have customers and we have the right customers, the customers who represent what could be success for them on a larger scale because these are, like I said, the people who tend to be a representative of the fuller market. It's not a fringe group of people is what I'm saying. You know, these these people are from, I, I, the unifying thing I would say would be they tend to be a little bit higher income and a little bit higher education than the average person, but all walks of life and different affinities. And, you know, there they're, they're are the folks that are, you know, hardcore campers to the people who, who want, you know, bamboo sheets on their king size beds. Like it's mm. everything, but they love supporting innovation and they love to be in the know. Interesting. And and in your dealing with, I think, so I was reading your uh, description, there was, you have worked with 3000 and, and more innovative companies around, um, around their launch. What are some of the commonalities or some of the common, um, worries or, 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 or problems that you see dealing with these these sort of wide slew of product or makers, as you said, like what are some of the common uh, theme that, that you have consistently saw that you could share? Yes. Um, I would say, first of all, let's be clear that when we've looked, we look at 300 products a week and we launch six. So hmm. the product is always strong. We are not dealing with weaknesses in its quality or its performance or its appearance. Um, That would be the case for many Mm. of the 294 we rejected. So these guys are Mm. already elite in a lot of Mm. ways. But as soon as they're on the market and competing with large companies, they have, I call it 16 different competencies they need to master. Everything from 
effective packaging to logistics to protecting their IP. And here's the, the, the interesting thing. When, when they show up, quite often by hook or by crook, they've already solved eight of the problems sufficiently. Hmm. There's another eight they haven't. And which eight they are is different hmm. from company to company. So probably how I could most help your listeners is talk about the ones that I think are more fatal, like the, the that I hope are not in the eight, it, you know, because there are problems that are not a big deal, frankly, hmm. like, um, I mean, even having poor packaging, that's easily rectified. It's not the most expensive thing to do. It won't necessarily be fatal as long as you haven't put out too many units in the market. Um, but there are other things. And if you'd like to get into that, I could talk about some of them more like, oh, please, I want you to know this before you even start type. These mm. are the problems we don't want to see. Interesting. And and um, you have, um, you are an industrial designer by trade, right? So, yes. And when you started um, a company, um, like, what was what were some of the unlearnings that you have to go through so it's when you when you actually get into this entrepreneurial template, helping some other companies with their industrial sort of with their um, uh, with, when it comes to um, product launch and creative work and like what were some of the some of the things that you need to that were sort of bold surprises or big surprises that you have to overcome um, while you were. Well, I would of, say. Um because I am a designer, I had a fairly ev evolved vision for what the brand and execution of the company would be like. Hmm. And it was really painful for me to embrace the idea of showing potential investors or employees something that was a pale comparison of that, like a very early prototype, hmm. which now kind of kills me because one of my core pieces of advice to it makers is to prototype the heck out of your idea. Hmm. But just imagine me in an investor pitch and I'm claiming to be a great brand builder and claiming to know how to do this well. And the executionist business, you alluded to it earlier, templatized, it mattered. This was not something where, you know, if the product wasn't surrounded by a good experience, it would work. Mm -hmm. And if I had it, and so basically I in the early days refused to use one dollar of investor money until I had all of their money because mm -hmm. I wanted to protect the first check by getting all the other checks. But if I had it to do over, I would have taken $10,000 of the first check and created a clickable prototype, rough and ready. It, mm -hmm. I would have probably hated it just to show people like kind of what zip code I was heading in because it's a very unique idea, this business. Mm -hmm. There was no such thing as daily deals or flash sales, e-commerce hadn't changed much in the prior 10 years. And so I would have like sort of held my nose for the parts I didn't like for the benefit of the illustration to potential investor employee. And frankly, I believe that would have sped things up, right? Like people mm. could understand what I was talking about um, and invest quicker or join the team quicker. So I didn't take my own advice that I now give people. Um, to like, don't be so precious about what that first mm. prototype is like, because its job is not to tell people what the final execution is like. It's there to create understanding and get reactions. Interesting. And um, I think every entrepreneur, they have um, in their sort of, in, when they're incepting their company and, and making growing it, one of the aha moment that, where they realize that, okay, now this would be a legit company. Uh, making some some legit impact like what was what was that point in in the in your journey as an entrepreneur uh, bringing out the grommet i wish i had a sexy answer it was the first big investor coming in um we lived on a pretty starvation diet for the mm. first four years and that was the most challenging thing i've been through in this company is to to do something that required capital like meaningful capital in a very bootstrappy way um so when we got our first um, big check, I, re I we, we had a huge accounts payable. We owed our makers a lot of money. And my memory of that check was sitting down on the front porch because we had, our office was like in this creaky old Victorian house and, 
and uh, I sat on the front porch and I had letters prepared where I was signing the letters, sending a check to pay off all of our accounts payable to our makers. Mm. That that was like <sighs> <sighs> such a relief. <sighs> we'll resume after a short break. This part of the podcast is brought to you by First Friday Fair, fastest AI powered way to find your next opportunity. Check out the website firstfridayfair.tao.ai and find your next dream job. Let's get back to the podcast. That is I think that's not uh, not many people uh, in this journey realize that uh, it's like I think we all are so glorified in this in this sort of entrepreneurial world of a startup and and all that pizzazz it, it brings but those sort of very uh, that debt free moment and that moment sort of when you are paying off your your big chunk of uh, IOUs I think that that's that's remarkable um, and thank you for sharing that and now no let's let's talk uh, let's let's jump um, the gun and talk about this book uh, how we make stuff now like what what sparked the idea to write this book it was the simple fact of watching these 3000 makers as we call them inventors and entrepreneurs solve all the same problems in isolation and it seemed as though it was time to claim our experience and our learnings and put it all in one place for the benefit of current and future makers interesting and and um like what were what were some of the things you could share um that that you you observed um some of the learnings for makers yes you mean the things so i think like even if people don't don't read the book the things that um i i i started to feel a real passion about sharing were around those things i mentioned earlier the sort of potentially fatal mistakes so the very first thing let me bucket maybe the, I'll, I'll talk about four or five of them um very first thing is making sure there's a big market for what you're about to do too many makers have an idea and they ask their mother, their brother, their neighbor, which is not market research. You should not fall in love in, with your idea until strangers do. And you should not fall in love with it until you know that there's a significant market for it. And that's a data project largely, mm -hmm. whether you're going to uh, industry sources or government data, you can go to your uh, small business administration, local office and help to get help navigating that kind of data to, to you know, sort of quantify your customer. Um, Google Trends is a great source for that. Even Amazon mm -hmm. to see what on the market and what the holes are in the market. Um, I, going to a trade show, oddly enough, can it's it's more qualitative data, but it's really helpful. If you're thinking about um, starting a product in a certain area, you'll get smarter faster than any other place you could go. So make sure it's a big target because it's as much trouble to build a small business as a big one. You might as well aim high. So that'd be number one. Like make sure you're not you're not just addressing a tiny market. Number two is I would name the company after your vision and not your first product. Mm. And an example people would know from probably the you know general business press is um, initially the company that's currently called TaskRabbit was called mm. Run My Errand. And that head on Run My Errand started there because the founder, she ran out of dog food and just thought somebody should be able to do this for me. So she had an Aaron's head and that was a natural name. But then her customers taught her, wait a minute, you know, this workforce can build Ikea furniture and can, you know, do kind of administrative tasks and do a whole host of things that she wouldn't have thought of on her own. But she probably did have a vision and TaskRabbit mm -hmm. represented that better. So it was an expensive change. And I would rather people think of that right up front because retailers don't like tiny product lines they like something that's going to take up some visual presence on the shelf and they like to see you have a vision for a full product line so you're worthy of that shelf for that end cap so it's important for your business to to have that vision um protect your intellectual property it would be 
you know, really front and center for me because I saw this article in the Wall Street Journal last week. It was um, all about how a couple companies found themselves uh, fighting off counterfeiters and copycats because they were on Shark mm. Tank. That is not why they are fighting. That r- article had it all wrong. The reason they were fighting them off were twofold. One, they possibly didn't protect their in- intellectual property. I mean, trademarks and patents. But if you list your product on Amazon, Amazon is like a super highway mm-hmm. to those counterfeiters mm-hmm. and copycats. And Shark Tank did not create that problem. Amazon did and eBay as well. So mm-hmm. protect, get in front of that um, right away. And then um, something we touched on earlier, I would say backing up a little bit, um, prototypes are like truth serum. So don't skip that step. Like don't jump to beautiful renderings or beautiful finished models um, of your, or even 3D printed prototypes until you've done some rough and ready ones like cardboard, like foam core, like clay, you know, even paper, wood. because you might surprise yourself with what a three-dimensional mm. representation is like compared to what you had in your head, but you get such, you get decent feedback from even something as rough and ready as a kindergartner might make compared to all the investments you might make in an expensive model or hiring a, somebody to do a CAD drawing for you. Your ideas just stop flowing the minute you're going into a highly a high fidelity prototype. You want to do really low-fi rough and ready prototypes interesting and um <clears throat> i think one thing you talk about um that fear of counterfeiters right so fear of uh, like protecting the ip it's i think you have a very interesting take like when 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 sort of i talk to a lot of entrepreneurs and then even when i was pitching um, about about sort of my early days of my startup um we hear we we hear a lot about and even i i also believe that don't worry about it just get your product out it's important market is so big you cannot like all you need is like two percent of the market share and you'll survive and all that fun stuff like what's your take um on the the businesses that you have um you have helped um their sort of paranoia towards towards this idea of hey i my ip would go out like people would go rogue and and they'll start producing this thing and i would have to fend that market out how real is that that paranoia and and what what do you recommend like what what, what's your take on that i i think of that in like two very different buckets if you're talking about you know you're forming your idea you're traveling around you're building a network I would, I would talk about my idea quite liberally. I think it's actually a, a rookie mistake to think your idea is so valuable that your, you know, your letter carrier is going to steal it, or you know, a lawyer mm-hmm. or a friend is going to steal it. That's that's very naive because ideas are not worth as much as the execution. Mm-hmm. You know, ideas mm-hmm. are worth very little, frankly, mm-hmm. um, and hardly anybody would ever fall in love with someone else's idea so much that they would throw off their over their lives to pursue it. So odds are you're safe. And odds are if you don't ask for help, you don't expand your network, you don't share your ideas, you're going to execute something poorly. You might execute a bad idea, mm-hmm. right? And like not getting feedback is such an amateur mistake. Mm-hmm. I distinguish that bucket from selling your product on Amazon, especially Mm. selling directly to Amazon because Amazon has built the perfect platform for counterfeiters and copycats. And that wasn't true in its early days, but in 2015, they changed a really important rule. It used to be that if you sold your product in Amazon, you had to have a domestic representative for that product. Mm. And Bezos, probably the best business person ever born have mad respect for him had his eyes on alibaba wanted to learn about that and opened up change that rule so that chinese companies could list on amazon right kind of makes sense you want to take on alibaba what he may be and, and he succeeded 25 percent mm. of listings mm. on amazon now come straight from china straight mm. from china but mm. what he probably didn't see coming was that the vast, vast majority of those are straight from the factory who's imitating existing, in many cases, American, you know, hard fought 
IP. Mm-hmm. And they're either counterfeiting or copying. And they're two very different things, both evil <laughs> and both mm. incredible. So I think today, Jeff Bezos is one of the biggest net destroyers of mm. American innovation on the planet because he's opened up that door, that super highway. And our makers don't understand that. Um, it might be surprising you, Vishal, because our consumer experiences with Amazon are so positive, right? What's not mm-hmm. to like? Good selection, great delivery. You know, the reviews, although many say the 50% are fake, they used to be super helpful at least. Mm-hmm. And um, and the fi- prices may not be the lowest, but they're always fair. They're not crazy. Mm-hmm. So what's not to like? And that's, you know, my, my makers at Gromit who yesterday were a dentist or a plumber or a teacher would say all those same things. They don't realize, whoa, 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 you just crossed the line. You're no longer a customer of Amazon. You're a supplier and you become unimportant to them. You're just a vehicle to mm. the c- customer. They care about the customer. They don't care about you and they use you. Interesting. So so what's the resolve? Like, So if, if you are in that world, you are seeing that uh, you have a front, front row seat to this maker revolution and you have a front row seat to these amazing innovators getting gripped by these sort of counterfeiters and then this sort of expanding market of what so where do you see where do where do you see the world heading to like what would you see as a resolve um that's uh, amazon is not going to change any day uh this is only only going to get worse now innovators are seeing that it's sort of now uh, a part of the norm uh, unfortunately so what what is your take on this We'll resume after a short break. This part of the podcast is brought to you by First Friday Fair, fastest AI-powered way to find your next opportunity. Check out the website firstfridayfair.tao.ai and find your next dream job. Let's get back to the podcast. Well, I think if we can, others can survive the um, steamroller effect of Amazon, there will be a resurgence and a flight to sources of trust and truth. Um, You see it a little bit right now with year Mm. over year for several years, independent booksellers are making a comeback. They've doubled the Mm. number since 2009. Mm. It's not that books are counterfeit. That's not an area where Amazon has any trouble. It's just Mm. that experience of like, oh my God, it's a sea of books. I might like to be around people who could give me a little advice or enjoy books as much as I do. And, And they've taken on sort of the experience of books. So, you know, it's a little bright spot. And I think traditional retailers in general, you know, you're not going to buy a counterfeit at Nordstrom. Their buyers are in, in in between you and the counterfeiters, making sure that doesn't happen. If you buy products at legitimate retailers, not marketplaces, marketplaces have a different remit. You have, you're pretty well protected. I really, you know, mm. I would say it's the exception, not the rule. It's not, certainly not 25% of what's at a Bed Bath & Beyond or at a, um, you know, a regular retailer, online or not. Um, it's just the marketplaces have, it's a buyer beware and it always has been. They, that was never their promise to you that we are looking at these products, we're making sure they're legit, we're making sure they work. A mm-hmm. Bed Bath & Beyond buyer, that's their job. That's what they do. You know, they make sure you're protected and their company's protected. And we gave that up um, for convenience and two-day shipping mm-hmm. in, in too many cases. And it, I, I will tell you personally, I would not put anything on my body, in my body. I wouldn't wear anything. I wouldn't put on my pet, my child that came from Amazon. I wouldn't put anything in my car. I wouldn't buy expensive electronics, power cords. Too, It's too risky. But people mm. don't know that. You know, I don't think people really know that yet. I'm kind of mm. a little bit the, you know, the, the, the person who's seen it too closely. Um, but I think that will become more and more known and um Hopefully, and I, I say it's hopefully because I'm not sure it's a given. We will uh, recognize the value of the folks who have traditionally um, looked out for the customer, you know, at the product level, not just the price and shipping level. Interesting. Wow, definitely a, uh, um, and and I do appreciate your your thought. I think because I think you have a you you have a perspective that. Um, that sees these things a lot. So I think I do appreciate you sharing that with, with our listeners and viewers. Um, other thing, um, I think uh, I was reading about citizens commerce movement. Um, yeah. Like what, what exactly is that? If you can walk. 
Well, we all, um, we have more power than we realize in the way we uh, interact with businesses. If we mm. ignore them, we shun them, we don't spend our money and we don't give them our attention, they fail. Mm. If we do the opposite, they prosper. And mm. for me, this is a little bit parallel to like citizen uh, journalism or citizen science. Like people have permeated the media and started to shape it and science as well. And I think we have the same opportunity and even more power to do that with business. Business is faster, has better resources than any other entity, but we're the ones who really have the power. So whether you are participating um, in shopping local or you are supporting a campaign on Indiegogo or looking at the grommet, you are taking an action against your own values, things you care about. And it's mm. really powerful. And personally, I think, you know, you don't, it doesn't have to be like your life's job to do this. You're probably going to buy your car from a big company and you don't have a lot of impact on how they, you know, behave. But if you took 10% of your purchases and really were thoughtful about it, man, mm -hmm. that is like, do nothing different, but redirect those 10% to companies mm. that look like the kind of world, they make the world the way you want it to be, 10%. Anyone could do that. That's a pretty pretty novel idea. I think I, I do appreciate that. Um, so how we make stuff now? Yep, the book. Yes. So what's how we make stuff now? Like what, what did you find? Well, what changed was, um, I mean, let's start in, with the internet. Like when I, I grew up as an industrial designer to create a product required massive professional resources behind you. I had a prototyping lab, you know, right outside my little cube mm. and I had a factory underneath my studio where I could go see how the things got made and I had engineers and I had, you know, market research and all the things that a big company provided. And many of those resources can be learned about, if not directly obtained through the internet you know, YouTube videos, when you want to fix something, well, just sort of imagine that you want to make something. Well, there's probably mm. a YouTube video that helps you understand how factories do one thing you need to do, you know, and mm. market research or find a designer. So internet has, the internet has been probably the most important platform to this change where regular people are making products. And then there are specific technologies like laser cutting or 3D printing or CAD that also make that cheaper and faster and better. So I'll tell you one story. This um, one of our makers makes uh, a little gadget, a very humble little gadget that peels hard boiled eggs. It's called mm. the neg. It's a, it's a, it peels a single egg very elegantly, miraculously. And she, uh, the entrepreneur was a web designer. So she didn't know anything about physical products. She just wanted to get this one done, figured out how to do it. And then she needed to prototype it. And mm -hmm. a lot of libraries, including hers in Connecticut, have maker labs. So she signed up for a 3D printing class to go prototype. And she, Bonnie Tyler is her name. And Bonnie, the web designer, is 76 years old. She walks in for her class and uh, the instructor, walks in too and the instructor walks in and he's 11 years old. This is the world I live in, like Bonnie to the 11 year old and across the generations, you know, in this case, sharing expertise. She had the idea, but he knew how to get it done. And that's kind of what's happening all over. Interesting. And, and, and I think um, fascinating story and thank you for sharing that. So uh, one thing we are we are seeing now is this resurgence of this 3D printing and and this um, these sort of maker labs and 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 so how is this impacting a typical design process nowadays? Like what 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 have, what are you seeing that if 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 I have an idea like what should I do? Like what would be my next five or six steps be or like if whatever you can share. Um, well, first, I'd, I'd back up and size the market, like I said, hmm. and then um, and then I would get into a process of building a network of people who could help me. Steve Jobs hmm. is famous for this. When he was 12 years old, he called Bill, Bill Hewlett of Hewlett Packard. He wanted to get some parts 
from Hewlett Packard, got the parts and got an internship. And at 11 or 12, he learned this playbook of like, why do I have to be smart about everything? I need mm. to do something, I'll find the smart person. Mm. So, you know, that sounds like a sideways step for a maker. You know, I've got a product, mm. I wanna make it, but mm. building that network is gonna be the thing that propels you the most. And a trade show is a great place to start. You can find vendors of all sorts who want your business and want to give you advice. You can find potential customers and you can find competitors all in one place. <laughs> so it sounds, you know, sort of painful, I'm sure, to get on a plane to Dallas or whatever, but it's 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 an express trained in knowledge. So I'm talking about a network and knowledge would be step number two. Then you get into um, ideation, which um, again, I think you don't have to be a me, an industrial designer to sort of get an idea on paper. Eventually you need a designer to make it viable and commercializable, but you can start with you know your own sketches and your own prototypes and start to get feedback. I, I love this one maker who has a, um, a product that um, she wanted to get feedback on a prototype and pricing and colors. And so she, she took a prototype and a bunch of surveys on clipboards to LAX, the, the airport. She mm. was about to go on a family trip. She told her family, I'm going to the airport three hours early. Meet me later. And she walked from gate to gate with her surveys, pretending she was market research lady, like she never revealed that she was actually the maker of the product and got people to give her feedback. And people wanted to talk to her because they're bored. And so they were very friendly and wow. helpful and they're a cross section of the entire country or even globally sometimes in some gates. And um, this is now her standard market research practice. She buys the cheapest ticket she can find. She doesn't fly anywhere and she goes back to the well over and over again. It's really important to not say you're the maker because people mm. will be too nice to you. You can tell them after the answer, but not before. Mm. Mm. So that's, that's the pro tip. Um, and it's such a friendly audience. Like they, they want to know, they're just curious, right? They're just sitting there wondering what you're talking to people about. Interesting. And and in, in, in from your vantage point, all the makers that you have seen, like what is um, some of the easiest fixable problems they, um, they make? Pricing. Or some of the easiest errors, pricing. Pricing is number one. Um, this is a very mysterious area for makers. And I think the first, you know, there are two rules here. One is uh, your price to the value of the product for the customer and not what it costs you to make it or not what you think it's worth. It's what the person's willing to pay. And you get really good information on the market if there are similar products. If they're not, it's a little mysterious. And we're really mm. good at helping with that. That's one of the areas we can most quickly provide consulting advice on because we have a an experience set with pricing that you know is, is is vast so sometimes you need an outside perspective on that but you can also go to the airport like i said and ask people mm -hmm. they'll tell you um the other component of pricing though is in, is indeed your cost structure and mm -hmm. a good rule of thumb is you have a viable product if you can produce it at one fifth the retail price i mean you know have it in hand in a package for one fifth. If you can see that happening at scale, it doesn't mm. have to happen with your first unit. It won't. Your first unit will be very expensive. But mm. if you can see at a quote, you know, get a quote from a factory for, you know, whatever, 10,000 units and it's at one fifth, you, you actually checked a really important box that you can make money on this product. If you, uh, I, when I've um, consulted with students at Harvard Business School, a lot of them are very enamored with the direct to consumer market mm. where you skip retailers. Mm. You hear it in the ads all the time. We cut mm. out the middleman. Mm. Well, they're gonna spend all the same money that they would have spent giving a retailer their margin mm. on marketing. So either way, you need it to be at one fifth. I don't care if you're selling it directly and spending on your own marketing or you're selling it to retailers and giving them a 50% margin. You need to have that price structure. And a lot of the students would come to me with a product they were producing, say, for $20, and they plan to charge $40. And I said, I hope you can charge 100 because, mm. you know, 40 to 20 is a bad ratio. You're going to be out of business. Mm. Interesting. Wow. That's a good that's a good insight. And, and, and what are some of the ingredients that you have seen um, for a successful maker or successful entrepreneur that, that it, has really made it? 
It's so funny you ask that because in March I did like, like this March Madness bracket thing where I, I, I identified the 32 traits of a um, a potential entrepreneur and then I had to pick, right? I had to like, I forced my own brackets like down to one word and one, and it was tenacity. And mm. tenacity mm. because, I'll give you an example. You, you can see makers who, um, you know, when there's a production problem, they ran out of inventory. There's a little bit of them like throwing up their hands. Well, oh, sorry, my, you know, my factory's delivering in, you know, two months. And and then another maker will, you know, air freight the inventory because they know leaving us and our customers stranded is not acceptable. They own the problem. It's always about, you know, tenacity is quite often just about ownership and being willing to push through the inevitable problems. Like I can see that almost in the eyes of a maker if they're if they're going to be that person who will push through me as their partner, I'll put up with just about anything, you know, because mm -hmm. I know that they're owning it and they're going to push. If they they sort of make every their problems my problems or make it the customer's problems, which is even worse, they're not going to be successful. Interesting. And and um so regarding this book so who is the um who, describe a perfect reader for this book or s uh, someone you wrote this book for like who would be yeah. an ideal reader for this i see I, i'm seeing it forming before my eyes it came out uh april 23rd so i hear who's yeah. buying it now that was mm -hmm. fun like to start learning that yeah. it's three things it's three buckets one, it's someone who um, who has an idea and they don't know where to begin, and um, and they really should read it cover to cover. Like they 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 probably you know will benefit from every chapter, and probably dog ear you know go back to some date later. For somebody who's currently in business, which is say our makers, even though they're telling me they're reading it cover to cover, that little bit surprised me because I honestly think it's mm. for them more of a snackable book. Like just mm. read the chapters that are your current problem. Read the introduction mm. and conclusion because they kind of frame everything. Like mm. skip right to the conclusion too, um, but snack on it. And then the third bucket that's really surprising me, and it maybe is 50% of sales from what I can tell, is it's like a graduation gift or a gift to that <laughs> you know friend who has an idea and you know that they have it in them or they just have this ambition and don't know where to begin. So they've never heard of the book but it's a great gift and that's the one that surprised me because I, can, I have to tell you Michelle I don't think I would give a business book to anyone if I hadn't read it myself like mm. that just seems like a True. you know strange thing to do but you know in many cases these are people who are already Gromit customers or know our products so they know what we're we know we they know we know what we're talking about maybe that's where, why they have confidence to do it but it still kind of surprises me but that's that's happening a lot, a lot of gifts. Interesting. And um, I think one area I want your perspective on is um, involvement of women uh, in, in this maker revolution. Like what is what is your take on, on, on uh, seeing the other half of um, uh, population, how they're contributing and how, how this book is helping and like whatever you can share about that. Well, I see a lot of hope there. Um, 40% of grommet makers are women and mm -hmm. about 50% of the campaigners on um, on Indiegogo and Kickstarter are women and women are 65% more likely to complete a campaign on those platforms. So this is actually one of the bright spots in entrepreneurship that, um, you mm. know, I would contrast to the majority of entrepreneurship where women only get 2% of venture capital. I mean, that's we're, we're not even mm. the 1960s there. I think we're in the mm. 1920s in terms of mm, opportunity. So um, I'm I'm happy to be to be playing a role here because it's been a you know really successful role. And I think women probably have a slight edge because we dominate mm. the consumer economy. So we have if we're buying 70 percent of the goods and services, then we're mm. seeing 70 percent of the opportunities too. You know we have a we have almost like a special edge that is really just a product of our existing lives and behaviors. Interesting. And and, and, and from your journey, like um, if there's any women um, listeners or viewers watching this um, and they are having struggle with 
raising capital and and as you rightly said it market is not there um where it should be in helping uh, our women entrepreneurs what would you suggest to them i'd say um if it's a physical product then like it, the stats i gave earlier about the crowdfunding platform should be very encouraging they have every mm. chance of success there there's no gender bias from what i can tell because the people mm. are supporting the campaigns are a diverse crowd mm. right mm. they're not what you would see at venture capital which people describe as pale male stale you know they're not <laughs> they're not a very homogenous group like venture capitalists tend to be so that's one thing the other thing is angel investors are mm. my heroes they're who really made our business possible and um they my own experience is because they only have to look in the mirror they're individual mm. investors you know investing out of their own capital they just have to look in the mirror and say do i think jules could do it do i believe mm. in her they don't have to go back to a partnership who's never seen the likes of me you know i don't look like any of their prior entrepreneurs which would be true in you know almost any vc firm you went to an angel doesn't have that problem they know you know that their wife or their daughter or their sister is a very capable person and they can make that leap to an entrepreneur without having to justify it to a whole male partnership so i think they can make um truer decisions you know like I, i'm not saying a venture capitalist individually have bias but i think when they all get in a room somehow they get very conservative and uh want to see somebody looking like their past successes and an angel doesn't have that problem they just have to believe in you and i had really high hit rates like uh, you know when mm. you pitch somebody that's what i mean like i think i i mm. got an investment from half the people i talked to and had terrible hit rates with venture capitalists and i pitched the same way but mm. you know the reality there the bar's higher let's be clear right. i mean venture mm. capitalists need to see a very large outcome but i was pitching a large outcome um so my own experience would tell me that there's something bigger than me at work and it's going to take a long time to fix so i would just stay i would just stay away i would go to accelerators i would go to angels i would go to crowdfunding places where there's more um freedom for the investors mm. to make decisions I, i think partnerships are not um i, I think they they are, are a hard place to make decisions in interesting um awesome so um when when and this this we ask all of our um, our author friends to to sh- to share about is if suppose um i end up re- reading the entire book like what will i be getting away with like what would i be gaining from this book that i wouldn't have known getting into the book i think because consumer products are are about the most complex but relatable businesses on earth you'd actually get a lot of really good business knowledge and it would apply to a service business or a software business. I share my best stuff. Like I put it I, I left it all on the field. You know, I have mm-hmm. a I have a long career and 10 years here and I wasn't holding back. I'm not writing a second book like this. I wasn't holding back my best stuff or, you know, part 2. <laughs> It's all there. <laughs> Pretty cool. um awesome so now uh, we are at the tail end of the conversation um uh, and jules thank you so much for walking us through this book it was pretty pretty fascinating and about the grommet so now let's spend few minute on you on on you as an individual so we ask all of our guests to t- uh, share if there are three things that are that has really helped you be what you are today like what would those be like what would those three things you attribute or these qualities are uh, you attribute your success to I learned at a young age how to walk through fear I set myself uh to boarding school I was 14 um mm. I got I, you know I kind of snuck in and applied behind my parents backs because wow. I was in tough Detroit public schools and I didn't relish the idea of th- more years of that so that was really scary to do and I was nauseous every day for weeks when I mm. started school and it was a great lesson so i would you know for other people who've done things that basically were really scary and they survived i would remember those experiences if you're taking on the next scary thing because they they build your confidence um i would say i um i'm a person who shows up for other people and in the business context that means i'm very helpful 
to other mm. people. And that sounds sort of self-aggrandizing, but I probably spend, I don't know, 15% of my day doing mm. something for the, the somebody else for something, an introduction, advice. Mm. And mm. I've always done that and I've never done it for return and when i and i didn't need anything until i became an entrepreneur and then i became very needy <laughs> i needed <laughs> everything so these many years of being that person really stood me in good stead of building a network sincerely uh, it's really relationships it's not like a network in the sort of kind of awful way that people think of networking it's literally just having relationships um i guess I think what people would say about me is that I'm um, I'm I'm very creative because I'm an industrial designer and I see things sideways. And this mm -hmm. business itself was very contrarian. We were launching when the economy was collapsing, and ultimately mm -hmm. the only thing that was exciting in retail was, were daily deals for a while, and we were under so much pressure then to be that. And I knew better, and I was confident in my own creativity or my own vision so I don't really care uh, I, I can go against the tide uh, I, I have had to 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 be a good designer so it's True. it applies equally well to entrepreneurship that's beautiful and thank you for sharing that and the other thing we we ask um, our guests to talk about some of their favorite books uh, that, that they, they have read so besides um, how we make stuff now like what are some of the books you would you would advise to our listeners and viewers? If we're talking business books, I really like a few. I don't read many business books, to be fair, because I, I kind of want to think about other things uh, mm. when I'm reading. But um, I love The Opposable Mind by Roger Martin. Mm. Um, mm. He's dean of the Rotman, or was, I'm not sure he still is, dean of the Rotman School in Toronto. Mm. I love um, Founder Stories by Jessica Livingston. Mm. A bunch of companies you probably know, but you know, getting at that really early story, she did a brilliant job with that. Um, a couple I've read more recently are um, I love Radical Candor by um, Kim mm. Scott. And it's a book I avoided because the title of it put mm. me off. I thought it was like, here's your permission to be an asshole. Here's how to do it. <laughs> and like, that's not my style. It's not that at all. It is really mm. about great management, communication, relationships. Um, book I want to get back to because I read it once and I thought it was really good for hiring and building a team. It's called Who. I'm not sure. I don't remember the author, but the, the title simple. It's just Who. And mm. I, I, I would go back to that book at some stage as well. Interesting. Thank you for sharing some ama amazing reads. Um, now, uh, we're at the last but not the least question on, on, on for, the, for the conversation. So if you need to give, um, if you need to tell something to our listeners and viewers, um, what would that be? What would be your closing remark to our listeners and viewers? Um, since we're talking about entrepreneurship so much, I think the quote right outside my office is pretty applicable. It was said by uh, Rear Admiral Grace Hopper, and she said, I'll, I'll paraphrase it, but it's something like, um, it's better to get forgiveness than to ask permission. Mm. I think it's a pretty good way to operate. Like, I... I don't, I don't let anyone get in my way um, if I think they're going to be an obstacle, but I don't mind apologizing if I've, <laughs> if I've gone too far or screwed up. Um, so I would say that. That's pretty cool. With that, um, thank you so much, Jules, for amazing insights for our, 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 our maker listeners and viewers. I think they would gain a lot of from this conversation. I do appreciate, wish you nothing but success in, in the grommet journey, in your journey. And in, in the book, we'll put the link uh, about the book on the description for our listeners and viewers. Do check it out. Um, and, and I'll personally make sure to go and, and write a review on your book as well. Thanks, so with that, thank, that. Thank you so much. Thank you, Vishal. I appreciate it. It was fun. Awesome. Uh, I thought I was sick of home, but actually I was homesick Never really knew that I would have to grow up so quick I'm so uncomfortable, don't know anybody here Just a couple dudes that I met once, that's it And I go into the booth feeling nervous Got butterflies in my stomach like I'm so worthless Is the mic gone? I don't know how to work this Inside I'm breaking down, I hope I'm not up on a